that, long live CSP. Uh, we will present the largest empirical study on the effectiveness of CSP in the web ever conducted so far. Uh, we have some overlaps with the previous talks of Stefano. And um, we are mostly focusing on the insecurity of whitelists. And we have also provide like, very strong evidence that uh, demonstrates that the whitelist-based approach is actually not working in practice and that we might should move to something else uh, which is like easier to maintain and also actually provide some uh, XSS protection capabilities. So my name is Lucas. This is uh, Michele. We both work for uh, the Google security team in Zurich. Um, we're working on CSP now for a while. We tried, like everyone else, to come up with a CSP for a couple of products, right, at Google. Uh, we failed, and uh, we thought this might be like a common pattern. So we tried to, uh, you know, make a survey and see how other people deploy CSPs and how easy they are bypassable. And uh, most importantly to mention here is we are mostly focusing on the XSS protection capabilities of CSP. So we're not looking into frame busting and other stuff, right? So it's all about uh, how well CSP is able to protect against XSS, uh, which is more or less the main use case for CSP, right? Um, the research questions we had was basically how are people using CSP on the web? Like, are they actually using it for XSS protection or do they just like do frame busting, right? Um, second, are the deployed CSP policies actually useful or, you know, kind of effective against, uh, as a protection against XSS, or are they just a waste of time and a source of breakages, right? Um, third, uh, this is something which uh, distinguishes our, like, our research a bit from the others. We really focused on the whitelists in CSP. And we wanted to find out if they kind of work in practice. And um, yeah. And last but not least, we tried to investigate if there's like maybe a better way to get the XSS protection capabilities out of CSP that is not uh, using whitelist. So a super short recap for people who just joined. Uh, CSP is a head HTTP header that developers can use to lock down the application. Uh, it is mostly a defense and depth mechanism, like a mitigation. So uh, it does not replace careful input validation or output encoding, right? But it can be a, like a really strong second line of defense if it's uh, deployed in the correct way. And uh, unfortunately, so far, CSP was not able to deliver this, right? But uh, we still have a lot of hope. And we also have some proof that it can work. Uh, I will. Uh, jump over this slide because Stefano already provided such an amazing introduction to CSP um, and jump directly to our data set. Uh, we were very lucky to be able to use uh, one of Google's uh, search indexes for this study. Uh, the data set we used had like a 100 billion pages. Um, uh, so what we did, we spun up like 20,000 machines overnight and extracted like 1.6 million hosts with CSP from that uh, corpus. Um, so with that said, so like the 1.6 million hosts, we needed to do some like post-processing, which I will explain on the next slide. Um, we basically deduplicated the CSPs and ended up with like uh, 26,000 unique CSP policies. Um, in addition to that, we also used the same search engine corpus to get a list of JSMP endpoints uh, in the web and also Angular libraries, because we use these to bypass the actual content security policy whitelists later on, right? So this is, uh, was very useful. Why did we normalize and deduplicate content security policies? There's mostly two reasons for doing so. Um, the uh, problem one is you can have a web page with like a thousand sub pages that all have a CSP, but if they use nonces or like uh, changing report URIs, you will come up with like a new CSP for every response. 
because there's like vari va uh, variable parts in the policy, right? For example, nonces or other parts, right? So you need to normalize these, right? And the second problem which we had was like that the same CSV very often is deployed across like thousands of host names because of uh, so-called so like off-the-shelf web applications like, you know, e-commerce platforms like uh, Shopify or Alibaba stores, right? It's like basically one product that is mapped to like uh, thousands of host names, right? So if you would deduplicate based on host name and CSP, you would have like a very strong bias on these like, you know, just three or four uh, actual products that use the same CSP, like it's all Alibaba and Shopify basically, right? So this is why we deduplicated based on like a normalized CSP and did uh, disregard the hosts because there's not much point in like reevaluating the same CSP over and over again, right? Um, so normalization is actually pretty simple. You pass the CSP, by that you get rid of like, you know, white spaces and uh, other uh, things that shouldn't be there. Um, you replace nonces and other variable parts like sometimes report your eyes with fixed placeholders and then you order directives and directive values. So there's like a very short example here. Uh, the stuff in blue is basically uh, uh, parts in the CSP that can be variable like on every response. But I mean the underlying CSP is still the same, right? So we don't want to reevaluate the, these, you know, uh, copies of the same CSP. So we kind of replace the variable parts with placeholders and then deduplicate. It's very simple. So uh, CSP use cases. Um, we had, uh, we said like it might be interesting to look how effective CSP is based on like uh, different assumptions. Uh, first we just took every CSP policy and evaluated if how many bypasses are there. The second one is like we restricted the set of CSPs to a set that actually uh, somehow seems to try to restrict script execution, right? Because there's not much point to assess a CSP that only does frame busting with, or like just has frame ancestors, right? And assess it if it's effective against XSS because the author probably never meant to uh, protect against XSS in the first place, right? And the third bucket is like strict uh, XSS policies this is uh, something we wanted to look into and it's basically policies that don't have all these like simple mistakes or like, like unsafe inline or URI schemes or wildcards, right? So policies that seem to like seriously try to prevent against cross-site scripting, right? Uh, from the numbers, it's like less than 9% from the total number, so it already tells you a lot of the quality of CSP policies that are around there, right? Um, so how did we evaluate the policies? Uh, as I already mentioned before, we were focusing on the XSS uh, mitigation capabilities of CSP, right? So all of that is just in, in this realm here. Um, very important, we only considered like C a CSP to be bypassable if we were able to find like an automatic and false positive free bypass, right? So for example, if you have a policy with unsafe inline and no nonce that would drop it or stuff like that, right? So if you have like a simple policy script source unsafe inline, that is like a very trivial to see that this is like uh, always bypassable, right? It does not offer any access protection capabilities. On the other hand, if you have a policy with script source unsafe evil, uh, it really depends on the application if there's like a path from user with user input to a, like an evil sync, right? So we cannot automatically verify that. So we would not uh, tag a policy with uh, script source unsafe evil uh, as bypassable just because it has unsafe evil, right? So we are very conservative here, right? And um, basically just like four big categories of checks that somehow overlap with that what um, Stefan already presented in the previous presentation. Uh, the first big bucket is like unsafe evil, uh, uh, sorry, unsafe inline in script source. Second one is like missing object source, right? It's a very common mistake. People restrict script source, but then they forget to add object source. And you can load flash files and bypass the policy again by that and have JavaScript execution. And uh, third category is uh, the use of wildcards in general, right? If you have a wildcard in policy, it's basically useless because you allow anything again. 
And uh, fourth and most important category for our research paper was the, uh, the usage of origins in the script source whitelist or object source whitelist that would allow to bypass the whole CSP. Uh, this is maybe surprising for some uh, people. It's nothing new basically, but it's just not all this very well known. A lot of people still try to come up with ways to build whitelists for like a whole web applications and generate whitelists. And in the end, they have like a policy with like 20 whitelist entries and it's useless because there's like 15 of these can be used to bypass the whole policy. We'll see that in a second. So this is a super short uh, summary of all the bypasses. I don't want to go too much into detail because we don't have so much time today, unfortunately. But um, you can read the paper or watch one of our previous presentations where we like, uh, explain these a little bit more in detail. But very briefly, as already mentioned before, uh, unsafe inline in script source defeats the XSS pro uh, protection capabilities of the policy entirely. You can just inject as an attacker script alert one whatever, right? Uh, very similar UL schemes or wildcards in script source. The attacker can just inject like script, uh, data, URI, and uh, inline JavaScript more or less, or he sources uh, the script from some attacker controlled domain if you have like, I don't know, HTTPS or star wildcard. Uh, missing or lax object source maybe is not as obvious. If you only restrict script source, or like in this case, like forbid script source entirely by setting script source to none, the policy is still useless against cross site scripting protection because an attacker can just load a flash file, uh, add like uh, allow script access, and then the flash file can execute JavaScript with same origin access. It's like, again, full XSS uh, execution. Um, on the bottom, there's like uh, all the whitelist bypasses, or basically just two examples of like very common whitelist bypasses. The one is like JSMP-like endpoints, which is basically uh, you whitelist a domain, and somewhere in that domain there's like a JSMP endpoint, and if this condition is met, the policy can be entirely bypassed. Uh, JSMP is like JSON uh, JavaScript object notation with padding, and it basically allows you to provide a callback, right? So the attacker can put arbitrary JavaScript in the callback, and the, this will then be sent in a response, and since he embedded it in the script tag, it will execute in the page, and CSP will not block it because it's sourced from script, uh, from whitelisted.com, right? Um, and also if the callback is uh, restricted in like the character set, you can still call functions, and with that you can do like a sum attack, which is like same origin method execution. There's another paper about that. And it basically, again, boils down to full access. Uh, uh, yeah. And uh, then Angular libraries in the whitelist uh, may be surprising as well. If somewhere on the whitelisted domain there's an Angular library, you can use that to bypass the CSP. Uh, so Angular libraries are very, very, very common in the web, right? Like CDNs, they, they host that, right? And very often people whitelist CDNs, right? So it's like a very common bypass. Uh, why is it a bypass? So basically every JavaScript library that does some sort of symbolic execution on top of JavaScript, right, can be used to bypass CSP in this way. So in this case, an attacker would just source the Angular library, and then he would uh, execute like an Angular expression, or in this case, even break out of the Angular sandbox which is not a security boundary, what most people think it is. And you again have uh, bypassed the CSP. Uh, results. So what is the state of the CSP on the web? As we saw before, it's uh, pretty bad. Almost every policy is like uh, trivially bypassable and does not really offer any protection against cross-site scripting. Uh, this is why we said uh, have the title CSP is dead, right, the first part. It is really not offering what it should, right? It's the XSS protection capabilities are really bad. So the second line, XSS policies, we see that a lot of people have still unsafe inline missing object source and wildcards and script source. So let's assume they can remove all of these, right? It's a tractable problem. Uh, they would still have the bypasses due to unsafe domains in the script source whitelist. Uh, in this case, we were able to bypass 79% per, uh, of all the policies just with the JSMP endpoints we collected in the, in the gathering, gathering data, uh, data gathering files in the initial step of our study. So this is a systemic problem for CSP, right? Because uh, 
CSP1 and like how most people use CSP, they use whitelists. And if you whitelist something, yeah, then it's not unlikely that it's just like a bypass. So how likely is it that there's a bypass? Um, so this graph shows like how likely it is that we had a bypass for our data set uh, if you have X or more whitelisted entries in your script source whitelist, right? So in this example, if you have like two entries in your whitelist, like foobar.com and self, for example, there's already like a 50% probability that we have already a bypass. If you spend some time on manually trying to find uh, JSMP or Angular libraries on one of these endpoints, you might, you know, be even better than that. And if you have 12 entries, like uh, the median of our data set was like 12 entries, uh, you already were able to bypass 94% of the policy of the whitelist bypass. And it is, 12 entries is kind of common for a whitelist-based policy, right, for a big product. Um, you also don't need to have Google uh, search index to do that. It is probably enough to look at the 10 most whitelisted domains, which is usually CDNs, widgets, uh, Google Analytics, right? And just search for Angular libraries or JSMP endpoints there. And if you take the top 10 together, that allows you to bypass like 68% of all the policies in the data set, right? And it's not only the top 10. If you take the top uh, 11 to 20, it's still like 63% of all policies, right? It's uh, really crazy. Uh, all of this is like really complicated for developers, right? We already had the question with the tool support before. Uh, it is not really easy for developers to understand what CSP does, how the spec defines certain things, what all the bypasses are, and what they have to look for, right? So we put all these checks we had in the paper into a tool and also shipped a tool with like 100 most common whitelist bypasses so developers can check the policies and see that they're insecure. And with that, we hope to like kind of bust this false sense of security, right? That some people think they, like some people think they are, uh, have a protection with CSP, but they don't, right? Uh, it's also open source, and as a Chrome extension, uh, feedback is always welcome. And uh, yeah, so do CSP whitelists work in practice? We think no. Uh, as already mentioned, also if you can fix like the, also, uh, the, the easy ones, like the unsafe inlines, object source, and wildcards, you still have the whitelist, right? And you cannot just remove every entry from the whitelist because then your site will break. And uh, there's a reason why people use CDNs, right? And also if, for example, you use like widgets, like Google Maps or Twitter widgets or like Facebook like buttons or whatever, they, you will need to whitelist them, right? And if you do so, your CSP is not offering any protection. So it's like a kind of a dilemma, right? This is why we propose to switch to nonce policies. And uh, with that, I will hand over to my colleague, Michele. Thanks, Lucas. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, we believe that our research showed that uh, whitelist-based CSP are not the way and do not offer uh, any, um, CSP, uh, any XSS protection uh, at all in the real world. And this is unfortunate, right? So the first part of our title, uh, CSP is dead. But we also wanted to fix that and propose something that would make CSP useful for XSS mitigation in practice in the real world, something easily deployable without the maintenance burden of a whitelist, of having to come up with a whitelist and maintain a whitelist. And so we propose uh, strict dynamic, which is already part of the CSP3 specification, which is now final by the uh, W3C. What we propose to do is to abandon the whitelist approach completely, which as we showed uh, is broken anyway. Uh, and switch to a nonce-based approach with dynamic trust propagation. I'll explain what this means in a, in, in a moment. Um, so nonces are not new. Nonces uh, exist in CSP2. The problem is that also, as Stefano showed before, uh, they are very uh, hard to be deployed in practice because uh, basically of the lack of dynamic trust propagation. So uh, I'll make a quick example. If you load an uh, external library that you don't control and that library dynamically loads another script, for example, it crea document create element scripts and then it append childs it to another element, basically the second level script would not, be, would not carry a nonce unless there is an explicit nonce passing mechanism. And this means that 
you can't use nouns with a lot of libraries and a lot of widgets, such as, I don't know, Google Maps or Twitter. Um, so basically, nouns are really not feasible in practice right now. What we propose is to grant trust transitively. So we propose to shift from a whitelist-based approach well, where the web admin basically trusts an origin that he or she doesn't control to never host, you know, JSON PN points, Angular, or other thing, to basically explicitly blessing the scripts in your markup and the scripts that they dynamically load. So if present in a script SRC, the strict dynamic source expression does two things. It discards whitelists that might appear in the script SRC, and this is done for backward compatibility, so that you can have just one policy that works for browser that supports CSP up to CSP 